Great, thanks very much. Uh, so, Adventures in Water Oxidation. First, I have to give my sincere, sincere thanks to the SCF for the prize. And of course, it's particularly welcome in view of my very close family and professional association with France. Uh, my first introduction to catalysis was at the uh, ECSN, and uh, it's where I came to see ways of uh, bringing about CH activation catalytically. And uh, sorry, I couldn't be with you today. Uh, so Mark Taifair asked me to give uh, connections with France, so here's lots of connections. But I particularly point out Odile but because uh, she was the one who greatly modified my way of thinking. Uh, and of course, Hugh Felkin as well, but uh, he is uh, uh, no longer with us, of course. And then many, many talks uh, and visits to, to France. Uh, now, the work today is uh, in collaboration with Gary Brudvig, a colleague in the department. And Yale is uh, a third of the way between New York and Boston in the province of New England, as you can see here. Now, it turns out that the oxidation of water is a very ancient problem. So you can see here Philosophie Chimique by uh, Fourcroix. And you notice L'Ancien La République, which is 1797. And in fact, he's de Fourcroix, but it was very unhealthy to be uh, de anything in, uh, at, under the uh, revolution. So uh, he wanted to avoid having his head chopped off and left out the de. Uh, so he pointed out in this book that uh, water is now known to be a combination of hydrogen and oxygen. And getting the hydrogen out is easy. We just pass steam over hot iron. Uh, but they found no way to release oxygen from water. But they recognized that this step must be possible because it occurs in photosynthesis. So it took uh, the late 20th century before water catalysis with homogeneous systems proved possible. And uh, Gary Brudvig and I came up with the manganese system. Manganese is important because it's the natural uh, oxidant, oxidation center. Uh, Tom Meyer came up with ruthenium, and then various other people with uh, uh, Nocera with his heterogeneous cobalt oxide. And then Bernhard was the first to use organometallics. So the point of the uh, story is that solar and wind power being intermittent requires storage. And uh, one of the ways of doing this is electro reduction of carbon dioxide to fuels. And for electro reduction, we need protons and electrons. And to do that, we model photosynthesis by splitting water. So we liberate oxygen, produce four protons, four electrons, which pass over to the reduction side and reduce the carbon dioxide or simply combine to produce hydrogen. And uh, what we need are some very high oxidation state complexes and ones which have ligands that are very, very oxidation resistant. So two key ligands involved here are uh, pi alk, which is our oxidatively stable, strong donor chelate, which is going to help us achieve these high oxidation states. And a very strong donor CP star, which is always assumed to be a reliable spectator ligand, uh, but here it isn't. So why pi alk? Well, it turns out that the nitrogen donor ensures binding even if the oxygen is protonated. And it's unsymmetrical, easy synthesis, and uh, I like unsymmetrical ligands. Reversible protonation at the oxygen, hydrogen bonding at the oxygen, water solubility enhanced by that oxygen, and the oxygen is obviously a strong sigma and pi donor. I think someone should mute because there's interference from somebody on in the session. So if we could mute, then that would be good. Uh, okay, so it's uh, the Thorpe Ingold effect. The Thorpe Ingold effect allows the chelate ring to be stabilized by the gem dimethyl 
right. effect, which also protects the benzylic positions, as uh, Nathan found here in uh, his, his uh, discovery of the ligand. And uh, rhodium usually occurs in the rhodium-3 oxidation state. And you can see on the left the yellow color of the rhodium compound with three pi alks. And uh, sodium periodate allows oxidation to the rhodium-4 state, but only for the meridional isomer. And this gives this nice purple color. And uh, it requires quite a high potential, 980 millivolts. So uh, Shashi was able to, to uh, get that compound nicely and uh, characterize it, uh, including the EPR, because one of the features of high oxidation states is that sometimes it is the ligand which is oxidized and not the metal. And so uh, we need to verify that the rhodium is uh, the oxidation center. And this is shown by the width of the uh, signal here, and also the rhodium-103 coupling uh, shown with the blue arrow. So those uh, verify that this is an authentic uh, rhodium-4. Now, if we move to iridium, that's the heavier element uh, immediately under rhodium, so it's easier to oxidize. And so in the meridional case, a mere 405 millivolts, which is quite a reasonable amount of uh, potential to apply. And indeed, all of these compounds are air oxidizable. Uh, so if you leave them in the air, they go from the yellow iridium-3 form to the iridium-4. Uh, which has these nice colors. And there is a big difference between the meridional isomer and the facial isomer, 350 millivolts difference in the oxidation potential. And it was Dimitar who proposed the uh, explanation because if all the anionic donor ligands are in the same plane, the blue plane in this case, then the DXY her orbital in the blue plane is going to be destabilized under crystal field uh, theory. And uh, we will have the situation as shown by the uh, arrow here, uh, in which the electrons are uh, raised in energy, making it easier to remove one or, in fact, even two, as we see later. And so this brings us to the homogeneous water oxidation catalysts depending on this ligand system. And our initial pi alk iridium system had a CP star and a chloride as co-ligands. And uh, curiously, on oxidation, the CP star is burned off uh, and lost. And we get a blue solution, which is a coordination complex. And uh, we can make it electrochemically with cerium-4 oxidant or sodium periodate oxidant. And in all cases, oxygen is uh, produced. Uh, the overpotential is 160 millivolts. Uh, we need a low overpotential because this is the potential above the thermodynamically required potential. So uh, obviously, for high efficiency, we want that number to be low. And 160 is very good. The turnover number is uh, greater than 10 to the 5. In fact, a, a, a company looked into this compound and uh, ran it for 10 to the 8 uh, turnovers. So this was uh, uh, very robust. And the turnover frequency is 1 per second. So that's not too bad. Now, a great difficulty in the whole area of water oxidation is that uh, homogeneous complexes often degrade to give heterogeneous uh, catalysts. And in particular, iridium dioxide is a good water oxidation catalyst. And therefore, we need to verify if there is any mass buildup on the electrode or any nanoparticle formation in the solution. And so the electrode can be tested with a piezoelectric resonator that has a tens of nanogram sensitivity for the detection of any buildup. Then we have dynamic light scattering, which detects particles in solution. And then we have a rinse test in which we uh, put the um, electrode 
once rinsed into a fresh solution lacking iridium, and we see whether it is active anymore. And so we were able to solve these problems and show that the system was homogeneous. On the right, the system here with the ligand has no buildup of mass on the electrode as we cycle the potential from uh, uh, 0 0.2 in the oxidizing direction to 1.5 volts. And when we have a strong potential, we uh, pass current, and the current results in the production of oxygen, but no production of the uh, particles, or, or I shouldn't call it particles, I should call it deposit on the electrode surface. Uh, when we do this lacking the pialc ligand with the uh, water complex, we deposit 150 nanograms of iridium oxide material on the electrode. And this, after the rinse test, this proves to be active. So uh, uh, James was able to show the uh, effect of the ligand in preventing heterogeneous uh, catalysis. And here is the blue solution. Um, no dynamic light scattering, no deposit, no change over time. And the CP star has degraded to 1.8 equivalents of acetic acid. And uh, this is active for water oxidation and CH oxidation. And the UV visible lambda max depends on the chelate. And therefore, uh, that's the first indication that the chelate is still bound. So the blue solution structure was uh, looked into by Uli. Uh, and uh, he showed that it was a mixture of isomers, and that's why we couldn't get crystals. Uh, EPR and magnetism were consistent with diamagnetic. O17 NMR showed the bridging oxygen to water ratio to be one to two. The XPS showed iridium four. Resonance Raman was consistent with a bridging oxo. Uh, the DFT modeled the UV vis spectrum, and the EDX gave a nitrogen to iridium ratio of one to one. And then uh, PKA of five was uh, associated, we thought, with one of the waters bound to iridium. And uh, the blue solution was also looked at by Moldy Toff mass spec. And, uh, the core of the molecule survives the uh, uh, um, mass spec experiment and gives an isotope uh, pattern which is consistent with the expected um, core structure. Now, Julie was able to show electrochemical activation and uh, bulk electrolysis also gives the same resting state uh, Julie preferred a different uh, structure, as you can see here, because we're not certain the exact uh, nature of the ligands, apart from the pi alk iridium oxygen iridium pi alk unit. And uh, this has a reasonably high Faradayic efficiency for oxygen, but because we are uh, simultaneously burning off the CP star, the difference between the current past and the oxygen that uh, uh, is evolved uh, is probably due to burning the organics to become carbon dioxide uh, and acetic acid, of course. And uh, Kelly put the catalyst on stilts uh, using a silotrain to connect the molecule to nano ITO, a conductive semiconductor. And uh, when she did that, she found O2 production, and in this case, there is no indication of any loss of CP star. And the probable reason is that uh, the silicon goes down with low coverage. Therefore, the metals are far apart from each other and do not chew each other up, so they are separated. And the turnover frequency is very low, far lower than the dimeric iridium-oxygen-iridium 
catalyst. So uh, uh, this was a indication that putting things on electrodes don't necessarily give you the same thing as you did when you had uh, um, the uh, solution phase. Now here's Odile helping us out once again, uh, an experimental hydrogen deuterium isotope effect of 1.6 agreed with the computed value for her mechanism. So her mechanism involves attack of the red water on the oxygen attached to the uh, iridium. Yeah. So if we think if we think of that oxygen as being O2 minus, then the nucleophilic attack of uh, hydroxide becomes possible because the two minus are handed over to the iridium-5 to become iridium-3, a good leaving group. Uh, and the proton lost from the uh, water, the red water, joins the bath, which is represented by the blue water, and the blue water gives up a proton uh, to the other end of the molecule to give hydrogen peroxide. And once one has created the oxygen-oxygen bond, then there's no difficulty in um, moving on to oxygen itself, the dioxygen, I ought to call it. Now, the oxo intermediate that Odile hypothesized uh, uh, is also consistent with the retention of configuration that occurs when CH hydroxylation occurs. In the case of cis decalin, oxidation by standard metal oxo uh, units such as P450 in biology, gives the trans uh, carbonyl on the right, which does not occur with the iridium oxo intermediate, and uh, which gives the cis. And uh, that is because, presumably, the standard oxo pulls the hydrogen off the nine position and produces a radical which rapidly inverts, whereas the oxine-like insertion into the CH bond that Odile um, hypothesizes is consistent with retention of the configuration. And uh, O18 incorporation is possible uh, very easily with 95% O18 enrichment. And this apparently is of pharmaceutical interest that uh, they often use isotopes to uh, look at their products. We also ran a CH and water oxidation simultaneously and with a big excess of water and a small amount of a water soluble CH substrate. And we found that in this case, the CH oxidation was favored over water oxidation by 10 to the four. So it's much easier to oxidize a CH bond than it is to oxidize water. And indeed, the CP star is not burnt off in the CH experiments. So the oxygen is uh, uh, able to attack the uh, substrate rather than the CP star of a neighboring iridium. Now, very interestingly, Odile finds that uh, the ground state of the oxo is a triplet. And if we follow the triplet surface, the black, and pass over this transition state, we make the wrong product, the transdecalol. On the other hand, if we have a uh, crossing point between the triplet and the singlet, which occurs at five kilocalories above the ground state, then we can pass along the blue curve and we can make the correct product, the cis -decalol. So this uh, oxine-like insertion is uh, caused by a uh, spin crossover between the states. Now, CP star is a complicated leaving group, and Daria decided to use a, an easier one. And this is now the preferred leaving group for us. And this dicarbonyl gives uh, analogous blue water oxidation and CH oxidation catalysts. Now, model compounds are useful because here we can make specific isomers. And uh, if we treat 
iridium trichloride with pi alk, we get all possible isomers. And each of these has been isolated. As you can see, they separate nicely on the column. They're all in the iridium-4 state by air oxidation. And uh, their energies by DFT differ very, very uh, big amount, uh, but they interconvert very, very slowly. Uh, the iridium-6 water 3 plus complex has a half-life of 300 years for water exchange. So iridium is the most inert of all uh, coordination inert uh, ions. And uh, so this helps us by allowing us to separate things without the geometries being affected. Now, the green isomer is the important one because it has all the anionic ligands in the same plane. And if we remember Dimitar's uh, hypothesis, this should provide the most stabilization for the high oxidation states. And if we treat the green isomer with silver oxide, we get the uh, bridging oxo of just one isomer, which can be crystallographically characterized. And if we have a short reaction time, X and Y remain chloride. But if we go for a long time, they are replaced by OH hydroxide. So now we can separate the products again. And GB1 means the green isomer uh, converted to the blue bridging oxo, one being the fast uh, moving isomer on the plate, and GB2, the, the slow moving isomer. And then the, we've also identified the other ones, but I won't go into those. And the XRD confirms the iridium oxygen iridium. Uh, these are diastereomers. So no big uh, difference between them. We have retained the green configuration with all of the uh, anions in the same plane. And uh, we can access a series of oxidation states. Reduction gives us the 3-3 three, three form in which protonation takes place at the ligands. Uh, oxidation gives us the 4-5. And further oxidation to the 5,5 five is not possible in water because we start to break down the water. And so we have to do it in dichloromethane. And amazingly, the uh, student was able to get crystals uh, and uh, get them uh, tested for their uh, structure. And they do indeed have the expected structure. So uh, the crystal structures of the four Five and the 5-5 five five are very similar. Uh, these are rare examples of iridium-5 in coordination chemistry. They're paramagnetic uh, in the 4-5 state, but uh, diamagnetic in the 5-5. Five five. Uh, the iridium oxo bond links are very similar in the mixed compound, so it's fully delocalized probably. And uh, we were only able to get the crystals by doing the electrochemistry and crystallization in the same vessel. And the some very small crystals were formed where we needed the advanced light source synchrotron at Berkeley to get the structure. So these were too small for the usual methods. And uh, Liam uh, made a ligand here, which uh, is capable of putting four alkoxides into the same plane. And in this case, the, uh, uh, the five state is the stable state. And uh, it's diamagnetic and gives a normal NMR. So this is very, very unusual for a coordination compound. So there are all the high oxidation states. And here's the crystallization of Liam's compound. And uh, this is something that might be helpful in general. It turns out that carbon tetrachloride is useful in growing crystals. This material doesn't crystallize properly unless a tiny amount of carbon tetrachloride is present. And you notice also the periodate counter ion as well. And this is not the only case where carbon tetrachloride has proved useful in obtaining good crystals. Now, iridium is the most expensive, uh, or I should say, the rarest of the uh, 
uh, platinum metals. And so uh, copper is uh, an alternate uh, uh, possibility for water oxidation. And here's Katie's uh, complex in which she takes pyalc with copper acetate and forms the, uh, the bis pyalc compound. And this also is an electro water oxidation, but it's only active in basic solution. It has a 550 millivolt over potential, so that's not so good. Turnover frequency 0.7, that's fine. And again, water nucleophilic, nucleophilic attack mechanism by DFT with the KHKD agreeing. And uh, she was also able to show that the more basic she is, the more we get of oxygen. And then detecting the oxygen here by GC. And here we have. Uh, the complex in the absence of water gives a nice uh, reversible uh, peak. And then uh, with the base present, we get the, the uh, catalytic wave. So it looks like general principles are that organometallic carbon donor ligands tend to be lost via oxidative degradation. But that doesn't matter because they're convenient precatalysts that give rise to coordination catalysts as the active species. And we tried very hard to make the same blue species from uh, coordination complex precursors without success. So there's something special about the organometallic starting materials that uh, allows you to get clean production of the blue solution. Uh, and so I have to acknowledge the funding agencies, Gary Brudvig, who has worked uh, with us uh, for many years, uh, Odile, who has done the, uh, uh, the uh, computations on this uh, story, uh, and then uh, various uh, students, and then the, the, uh, many of them have gone on to faculty positions, as you can see. And then finally, here is Odile. Oh here is our solar group where four um, PIs collaborate in doing uh, this work. Although in this particular case, it was uh, Gary and myself who did, the, uh, who did the, the work I've talked about. So that's it. Thanks very much. <laughs>